So good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Tom Banchoff. I'm director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown. And on behalf of the center and our partner, the Public Religion Research Institute, I'm delighted to welcome you to this morning's launch of our Millennial Values and Voter Engagement Survey with the subheading, Diverse, Disillusioned, and Divided. Uh, we've got a lot to discuss. Some of you were with us six months ago when we launched the first survey in this series. Uh, that survey focused on 18 to 24 year olds, their attitudes on faith values in the political process. This survey follows up on that in a couple of different ways. We circle back to some of the most interesting findings and ask some deeper questions. But of course, we also bring in the election, uh, which is just a month away, and there are lots of fascinating results related to youth, their level of engagement and interest, where they come down on the issues. I'm just going to introduce the speakers, um, the most important of whom to my left is Dan Cox, our partner at PRRI, the research director there, a co-founder, um, who will present the survey findings. Uh, before moving to PRRI, Dan uh, was a research associate at the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, and his work has appeared widely in the New York Times, for example, ABC News, CNN, Newsweek, and other outlets. After Dan has had a chance to present the findings, we'll hear from Laura Session Stepp, who is known to many of you as a freelance writer, a former Washington Post reporter, uh, and Laura is currently a senior media fellow at the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy. She's an expert on children, adolescents, and young adults, and contributes regularly to CNN.com and HuffingtonPost.com. Her most recent book is entitled Unhooked, How Young Women Pursue Sex, Delay Love, and lose at both. We'll then hear from Hira Baig to my far left, who is a sophomore at Rice University. Hira is here as one of our Millennial Values Fellows. Just a word of background on that. Starting in April, we began an online conversation among young people to reflect on some of the themes raised by the survey. That included uh, a couple of essay or blog contests. And from those who participated in these national contests, we brought together now 15 fellows from around the country to help us reflect over the next couple of days on the survey, on some broader issues raised by the survey, to interact uh, around the online conversation that has already started. And we're delighted that Hira Baig uh, is here um, representing the fellows to provide the perspective of a millennial on these findings. She's a sophomore at Rice University, a political science major with an interest in religion, public policy and politics. She's also president of Rice University's pluralism campaign, as well as a member of the speech and debate team. So thank you all for being here. Thank you all, thank you fellows for being here. Uh, in terms of format, after Dan's presentation, and we hear from Laura, and here I'll ask a couple of questions on the findings, and we'll have ample time for questions and discussion from the audience. Before turning it over to Dan, I'd like to thank you all again for for coming, but also acknowledge the generous support of the Ford Foundation, which has made this project possible. So, Dan. Uh, thanks, Tom, for the introduction and for being a great partner uh, in this project. Um, and thank you all for coming out for this uh, release of the survey report, Diverse, Disillusioned, and Divided, uh, Millennial Values and Voter Engagement in the 2012 Election. Uh, before I dive into the main findings, uh, I'm going to briefly discuss uh, methodology. Uh, the Millennial Values and Voter Engagement Survey uh, is, as Tom mentioned, a joint project between Public Religion Research Institute uh, and Georgetown University's Berkeley Center on Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Uh, the survey is of 1,200 uh, young millennials aged 18 to 25. Uh, it was co conducted between uh, August 28th and September 10th. And it's actually the second wave of a two-way panel study, the first of which, um, as Tom mentioned, was conducted uh, last spring. Uh, both surveys were conducted online using uh, Knowledge Network's Knowledge Panel, which is built from a nationally representative uh, probability sample of the U.S. adult population. Uh, the margin of error is plus or minus 4.3 uh, percentage points, and it was funded by a generous grant from the Ford Foundation, as Tom mentioned. Uh, so voter engagement, this is a big question in the 2012 election. Um, in 2008, we saw historic turnout among uh, young voters, and there's been 
studies are now out that suggest that uh, there's a degree of apathy uh, this year among younger voters that wasn't seen in 2008. So the big question mark is, will they vote? And uh, our, our findings really uh, paint a pretty uh, pessimist, pessimistic picture um, on uh, youth and voter engagement in 2012. Uh, only two-thirds are registered to vote currently, um, and this is in September. Uh, only half say they're absolutely certain to vote this year. Um, and less than three in 10 say they're paying a lot of attention uh, to the election so far. Uh, we see some pretty significant differences by race, but it's really uh, Latino millennials that stand out. Uh, so only about half say they're registered to vote, um, and only about a third say they're absolutely certain to vote this year. Uh, one of the big themes um, of the, our, our last survey was the influence uh, of parents. And we actually found in that last survey that uh, millennials tend to have a pretty close relationship with their parents. They're either living at home or tended to uh, talk with their parents frequently, some uh, uh, daily even. And so we asked uh, our millennials, uh, did you ever uh, accompany your parents to the voting booth on, on election day? And we found, well, four in 10, so they did do this. Um, and there's some differences by race. So we found uh, about half of white millennials uh, reported accompanying their parents to the voting booth, uh, four in 10 uh, black millennials, and about a quarter of Latino millennials. And we were really interested, not just in whether they did this, but what impact this had on uh, voter likelihood. And it's pretty significant. So among young, younger millennials who reported ac accompanying their parents to the voting booth on election day, 84% are registered to vote. Uh, two thirds say they're absolutely certain to vote. And about four in 10 say they've given a lot of thought about the election. Uh, now look at the three bars right below, and we see really, really different patterns. So overall, uh, only about half or a little more than half say they're registered to vote. Uh, four in 10 say they're, they're absolutely certain to vote, and about a quarter say they've given quite a lot of thought about the election. Um, so we're seeing really different gaps between these two uh, different groups by just this simple experience of going with your parents to the, to, uh, the voting booth on election day. Uh, we also asked millennials in their own words uh, why they thought young people didn't vote. Uh, and there are a variety of answers, but the most commonly mentioned one was uh, apathy or disinterest. So things like uh, politics is boring, or I don't really care that much about politics, um, or if I find it not interesting were uh, the answers most frequently mentioned. Um, but 14% also said uh, they don't vote because they're busy. They are attending school and working maybe at the same time. Um, or voting is difficult. Uh, tr they travel a lot, or, or they're moving around a lot. 13% uh, said uh, voting doesn't really count, doesn't really matter um, whether I vote one way or the other. 13% said millennials are lazy as the reason uh, they don't vote. Um, about one in 10 said uh, millennials are informed is the, is the major reason they're not voting. Uh, and 4% said they don't like their, their choices, they don't like the, the politicians or candidates. Uh, next, we're looking at voter preference and political outlook. So overall, Obama has a significant 16-point advantage over Romney uh, among younger millennial voters. This is actually an increase uh, from April when uh, Obama had only a seven-point advantage over Romney, 48% to 41%, um, although it's actually uh, significantly down from his 2008 performance in which he captured uh, two-thirds of the younger millennial vote. Again, we see strong differences by uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, nearly all black millennials are supporting Obama, seven in 10 Hispanic younger millennial voters also supporting Obama, and um, Romney is actually ahead by a significant margin among uh, younger white millennial voters. Uh, and this is actually also different than it was in 2008, uh, where Obama edged out uh, uh, McCain among these voters in 2008. Looking at uh, the patterns of vote by religion, we find that um, similar patterns are going on here. So Romney doing uh, quite well among uh, white Christian millennial voters. Uh, and Obama doing much better among uh, minority Protestant voters and um, unaffiliated voters. So eight in 10 uh, white evangelical Protestant millennial voters uh, supporting Romney, a majority of white mainline Protestant millennial voters. Uh, Obama leading among Catholic uh, millennial voters overall, but uh, this is largely because of his overwhelming advantage among Latino Catholic uh, voters. Uh, seven in 10 minority Protestant and unaffiliated voters are also supporting Obama. Uh, so we were not just interested in understanding the uh, principal impact on millennial uh, voter likelihood, but we were also interested in seeing if there was any impact on voter preference. And we found a, a pretty significant one, actually. So when we asked millennials, well, who their parents, they thought their parents were supporting, um, we found that among millennials who said that both parents were supporting Obama, 96% are also supporting Obama. Uh, a similar pattern uh, was true for Romney. So among millennials who, who, whose parents are both supporting Romney, 
84% are supporting the GOP candidate. Um, so really, really strong relationship here. Uh, we asked another open-ended question uh, among Obama and Romney supporters, uh, the reasons uh, they were supporting their preferred candidate. And as you can see, the, the uh, brightly colored uh, pinwheels here, that uh, Obama supporters cited a number of different reasons um, than Romney supporters. So I'll just walk you through them first among Obama supporters. So 15% uh, said they, they were supporting Rom uh, Obama because they don't like Romney. 17% um, uh, said they, Obama shares their views. Uh, and 15% said uh, economic and social policies, which include things like the environment, um, contraception, uh, and education. About one in 10 uh, say that they're supporting Obama because he's doing or trying to do a good job. Uh, about one in 10 said, uh, mentioned the healthcare law that was passed in 2010. And less than one in 10 uh, said they, they are supporting him because they liked him, or they mentioned the uh, positive personal quality, uh, or said that he would benefit the middle class or the poor. Only 3% mentioned anything about progress or change, which is notable because uh, these were strong themes in Obama's 2008 run. Now, turning to Romney supporters, the pattern is quite different. There are actually fewer, there's fewer diversity in the, in the things that are mentioned. And um, the largest one is, you can see that, that uh, green wedge, uh, is they're supporting Ro uh, Romney because they don't like Obama. Um, uh, over a third said this. Uh, one in five said they're supporting Romney because uh, he shares their views. 15% said uh, something general about the economy or the budget for the reason for supporting Romney. Uh, one in 10 said uh, change or moving in a different direction was the reason. And about 6% said uh, because they liked him or because of personal qualities. We also asked a series of candidate characteristics and asked, uh, do these better describe Obama or better describe Romney? And as you can see uh, from the blue bars, Romney ha uh, Obama has the advantage among most of these uh, character traits. Um, however, his advantage is much stronger among personal traits like, personal traits like honesty and trustworthiness uh, than leadership traits like uh, can get the economy moving again. So I'll just run you through a couple examples here. Uh, so uh, cares about people like me. 57% uh, uh, said this better describes Obama, while 26% uh, uh, said this better describes Romney. Uh, looking similarly at uh, honest and trustworthy, 56% millennials, percent of millennials say this better describes Obama. 29% says this better describes Romney. And if we skip down to can get the economy moving again, we can see the gap is narrowed considerably, uh, indicating that uh, on leadership traits, um, the, the gap is much narrower. So 49% say can get the economy moving again, better describes Obama. And 37% uh, said this better describes Romney. We see that at the bottom, ha having strong religious beliefs, uh, this is the only trait where uh, Romney beat out Obama among uh, millennial, millennials. 54% said this better describes Romney. 32% said this better describes Obama. Okay, uh, turning to religion in the, in the election. Um, in other surveys, we've asked uh, how important is it uh, that a president have strong religious beliefs? Very important, somewhat important, not too important, or not at all important. Uh, and overall, 66% uh, of Americans says it's very or somewhat important that a president have strong religious beliefs. Well, as you can see here, the pattern's quite different with millennials basically divided, with about half saying it's very or somewhat important, and uh, as, basically as many saying it's not too or not at all important. Um, however, there are some significant differences uh, by partisan affiliation. Uh, we see seven in 10 Republican millennials saying that it's important, while majority of Democratic and independent millennials say this is not too or not at all important. Uh, we also want to look at uh, the level of comfort with millennials of uh, presence with certain types of religious backgrounds. Um, and here, the, uh, the comparison between millennials and the general public is instructive. Uh, overall, we see six in 10 millennials say they're being covered with an evangelical or born again Christian uh, president, um, but less than half say they'd be comfortable with a Mormon, an atheist, or a Muslim president. Um, and again, uh, this, the comparison from, with the general public is interesting. Uh, there's more comfort among the general public uh, for evangelical and Mormon presidents. Um, and less comfort uh, for atheist presence. And part of what's going on here um, is uh, the religious composition of uh, millennials is significantly different um, than the religious composition of Americans overall. And what we, we find among younger millennials is a number of them are uh, either unaffiliated or atheist or agnostic. And um, among those who are, there's significantly cooler feelings towards evangelicals and Mormons and obviously um, warmer feelings towards atheists. So that's part of what's going on um, in these differences. Uh, turning towards efficacy and uh, democratic participation, this is where the uh, disillusionment comes in. Um, we paid a pretty negative picture or pessimistic picture of millennials' views of the political process. 
Uh, eight in 10 say business corporations have too much influence in the political process. Uh, nearly as many say elected officials in Washington lose touch with people pretty quickly. Uh, over six in 10 say we need new people in Washington. Uh, people like me don't have any say about what the government does. And the government is not really run for the benefit of all people. So really, uh, yeah, not painting a very optimistic picture of uh, how millennials are perceiving uh, their political process and, and uh, uh, government in Washington. Uh, however, uh, Looking at another question about voting, we see that, well, there maybe is some hope here. Um, seven in 10 uh, younger millennials say that voting gives people like me uh, some say about how the government runs things. And we see this is actually true across uh, racial and ethnic groups, with three quarters of uh, black millennials and about two thirds of white, Latino, and, and mixed race millennials agreeing with this statement. So there's some tension there. Um, views of the political process somewhat negative. Um, however, the view of the act of voting still viewed fairly positively um, in that it can make a difference. Uh, the last section I want to talk about is affirmative action. Um, and our focus on this actually grew out of the first study uh, when we found really strong uh, polarization uh, by millennials by race and ethnicity. And it was, for some of us, uh, uh, quite unexpected. Um, this is the most diverse uh, generation in American history, both racially, religiously, ethnically. Uh, younger millennials report more social interaction with people different than themselves, which tends to lead to greater social acceptance. So there was some sense that on a lot of these issues, there'd be sort of uh, a more consensus among younger millennials on a lot of social and political questions, but that is not actually what we found, particularly on issues of racial discrimination. Um, so we thought the issue of affirmative action would be a really good way to dig underneath this to see what's going on. Uh, many uh, millennials obviously in this age group are either entering college, in college, uh, or recently graduated. So we thought it would be fairly salient. So uh, looking at sort of general support for affirmative action, the principle of affirmative action, uh, the question we asked was, in order to make up for past discrimination, do you favor or oppose programs which make special efforts to help blacks and other minorities get ahead? Um, overall, more millennial millennials oppose uh, the principle of affirmative action than support, uh, 49% versus 38%. Uh, we look underneath, however, we see really strong uh, racial and ethnic divides with three quarters of uh, black millennials uh, supporting uh, the principle of affirmative action, six and, more than six and 10 Latino millennials, um, and two thirds of white millennials are opposed. However, when we look to the, specifically at the context of college admissions, we see a pretty dramatic change uh, occurring. So uh, seven in 10 younger millennials actually oppose uh, uh, preferences for blacks and other minorities in college admissions. And this is true uh, across parties, uh, although we see some degree of difference in intensity. So nine in 10 Republican millennials uh, say that, they should, uh, that blacks and other minorities should not receive uh, preference in college admissions, uh, seven in 10 independents and white Democrats, and about six in 10 uh, Democrats overall. We also wanted to ask, okay, what are the reasons uh, for, su for supporting uh, affirmative action programs? And uh, again, uh, there's some strong opposition uh, by millennials, but really what's interesting here is the reasons millennials give uh, for supporting affirmative action. Um, and many more people say it's important for affirmative action to increase diversity as opposed to making up for past discrimination. Um, and this was actually true across the board. Uh, it was true for white millennials, um, significantly more saying uh, increasing diversity is more important than making up for past discrimination. It was also true among uh, black millennials and Latino millennials. Um, as well, although you can see there's obviously difference in whether uh, these groups think it should be done at all. Uh, finally, we're interested in uh, perceptions of millennials uh, and the uh, potential impact of affirmative action on, on their either college or uh, um, career options. So we asked, do you think that you were helped or hurt in college admissions process because of your race or gender? And despite the fact that there's a pretty significant opposition to uh, affirmative action in college admissions, we find that most millennials think that they weren't really impacted by affirmative action programs. Uh, so for instance, only 15% said they were hurt, um, about half that number said they were helped, um, and about one in 10 said something else. And we also asked, do you think you'll be helped or hurt by your gender or race um, uh, as you enter your, uh, your career? And again, really similar patterns here with about uh, over six in 10 saying that it wouldn't make a difference, their race or gender. Um, about one in five saying they would be, it, would, it would hurt them and about one in 10 saying it would, it would be helpful. And uh, again, um, there's actually pretty stable opinion here across uh, gender and race. So we, we find more than six in 10 uh, millennial women and millennial men 
saying that they uh, won't make a difference. Um, two thirds of white millennials uh, and a majority of Latino and African American millennials. Um, what is notable here though is that uh, Latino millennials are much more likely to say that their race or gender um, will help them professionally, uh, while uh, black millennials will say uh, much more likely to be hurt than helped. Okay, I'm going to stop here for now. Um, there's a lot more in the report, and I think we'll get to it um, in the Q&A, so look forward to that. But now I'm going to turn it over to our, our esteemed panelists. Thank you. Laura? All right, there. Let's have some applause after each speaker. That's a good policy. Okay. It makes us feel better. <laughs> makes, it makes worth getting up in the morning for. Uh, we all live for applause. Uh, it's, uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm actually really delighted to see so many young faces. Um, I am going to talk about those of you who are millennials or maybe on either side of millennials in the third person. So please don't be offended when I say they, and I really mean you, um, because I wasn't quite sure of the makeup of this audience, but it's really wonderful to have so many young people um, here, and you actually should be up here telling me, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. Um, you know, I, I, it's really great to be back on this campus. Um, when I was, first came to the Post, I was covering religion, and um, I, uh, one of my favorite uh, sources was someone that older people here would remember is Father Brian Hare, who's now at Harvard. Um, Father Hare used to say that everything could be explained in three points, which I guess is not unusual for a Catholic priest. And he would always have this little smile. And indeed, when you, whenever he went to give speeches, he would deliver them with three points, you know, the trinity of Father Hare. And, um, and so I thought I'd do that same thing. I'll follow three points of inquiry that I found particularly compelling in this report. Um, and a few questions that some of these points raised in my head. The first I want to talk about is religion. Um, I have written about, other reporters have written about the abandonment of the church by young millennials in significant numbers. I think the first time I wrote that story was about 15 or 20 years ago. And so it's been true for some time, uh, particularly for young people who may, we might call moderate to liberal. But now, the, I think there's a change here, and I think part of the change is that we're also seeing young moderate to conservatives leaving the church. And in fact, there was a book some of you may be familiar with, uh, written by David Kinneman, who's only 38 himself, president of the Barna Group, an evangelical research firm. He put a book out recently calling, called You Lost Me, Why Young Christians Are Leaving Church and Rethinking Faith. Um, and I, I've talked to David. I wrote a column about, about his book, and I was in, really intrigued that even those who we think of as being the most churched among millennial generation are also leaving. In today's survey, we read that young millennials are significantly more likely than the general population to be religiously unaffiliated. Um, they are also significantly less likely than their elders to say they are definitely going to vote in November. According to the survey, 50% say they will, but that's 20% fewer than Americans overall. So my question here is, and a lot, we have a lot of questions and almost no answers, but it's good to have the questions. Is there a connection between their disaffection for organized religion and a disinclination to vote? Another question I have is, the, the religiously and unaffiliated are a not significant group, and they prefer Barack Obama over Mitt Romney. So what are the Democrats doing to get them to the polls? And will Romney attempt to win them over? I think they could be a, a, a swing vote for, this, for your particular constituency um, if the candidates really worked that hard. A couple of other findings on religion intrigued me. Uh, young adults said that Romney more than Obama had strong religious beliefs. This interested me because compared to Obama, Romney talks very little about the specifics of his faith. In fact, we know very, very little about that. Is it important that a president be openly religious, or is that a dangerous thing with so many people being religiously unaffiliated? 
uh, young adults were divided about one half over that question. Would they be comfortable with the president of, a Mormon, of the Mormon faith? Not so much. Six out of 10 said they'd be comfortable with an evangelical Christian, but only four out of 10 said the same thing about a Mormon president. The second set of questions I want to take note of relate to race. I was struck by the fact that on a number of questions, white millennials appeared to be more divided among themselves about the two candidates than were blacks and Hispanics. For example, 40% of all millennials reported a positive view of Obama, 44% a favorable view of Romney. However, when millennials were divided by race, blacks and Hispanics were solidly on Obama's side of most issues, whites were divided with the majority leaning toward Romney on traits such as leadership and getting the economy moving. An interesting sign of the times also, I think, was that support for affirmative action was less strong than I expected among all groups. Now let me back up and tell you how old I am. I remember and getting my first job and as a reporter on a small paper in Florida and being told by a, a man not too much older than me on the competing newspaper that, oh, it was nice to see me and someday I would have a real job. I remember my second newspaper going there, moving into an editor's position, learning that I was being paid significantly less than the man who had just vacated that position. I had to fight all the way up to the top, the executive editor of the then Philadelphia Bulletin, to get myself a comparable salary. So affirmative action to me is very important. Um, on, this, on the question about college admissions and hiring, fewer than one in 10 whites thought preference should be given to minorities. Blacks and Hispanics were more likely to agree on preferential placement, although this support, their support was not as strong as I would have thought it might be. For example, 42% of black millennials thought preference in hiring minorities was okay, 44% did not. That's pretty remarkable. And lastly, let's touch on gender. A majority of those polled didn't support affirmative action. This is a significant generational change and raises a couple of interesting questions. Do millennials believe that discrimination against minorities, women, and so forth, do they think that's over? Or that it will disappear with time? It's possible. And when I think about why these attitudes have changed, I just remember the playgrounds and the classrooms and the college classrooms that I've been in over the years. Um, really, I think young men and young women are, feel much more equal with each other, and I think that's terrific. Um, they've gone to school with, played sports with, and dated students from diverse communities. Many of them talk about friends who come from different backgrounds without ever mentioning those differences. So back in the day when I was in school, you would say, well, my black friend, you don't hear that now among your, your age group, the millennials. And I think that's a positive sign. They say things like, I'm not sure what I think about this. I met this girl when the woman they're referring to is 26 or 27. Um, I can tell you for sure that when I was in my 20s, if someone had called me or my friends a girl, I would have jumped all over that person. <laughs> and yet, today, young women don't even hear that. Three out of five millennials, women and men, say their gender or race will have no effect on their careers. We saw that up there. Again, I think a pretty astounding fact. And I hope, you know, I really hope they're right. I'm not sure they're right, but I hope they are. So what does all of this mean and what do we do with it? Their disaffection with certain institutions, the church, politics, government, feels broad and deep to me. And yet I think they're not so tuned off, turned off that they think things can't improve or change. For example, seven out of 10 millennial men and almost six out of 10 women would like to see new people in the halls of power here in Washington. One of the findings that I really resonated with, and I don't think I've ever seen this in a survey before, is the idea of parents taking their children into the voting booth. Um, I'm, I'm really, really glad that that's in there because I have, I've been saying that for so long, I'm getting hoarse. 21 years ago, I took my six-year-old son into the voting booth. 
but imagine this. I mean, there's this Arlington gymnasium. I'm standing here with this little boy, and I, know, I don't know anyone who's ever done that before, taken their kid in the voting booth. And I think maybe it's illegal. And <laughs> seriously, I thought if I take him in the voting booth, they're going to discard us. You know, I won't, my vote won't count. And so I went up, I found the polling officials, and I said, can I take my son in the voting booth? And he said, yes, he can barely even stand up and reach the computer. I don't think there's a problem. So we walked in, and Jeff was really eager to see how this worked, and he was very excited about it. And ever, in every election after that, he went into the voting booth with me until, you know, it was a little silly to take a 16-year-old into the voting booth. <laughs> but he has remained incredibly engaged in politics and very interested and very argumentative. Um, and what I noticed that most on Facebook, which gets me to my final point. I think that Facebook and other sites like this are your generation's, millennial generation's, village squares for civil debate and discourse. And I wonder whether we older adults need to work harder at using technology to stimulate political debate and political conversations online. I think that's the future, and I think we've got to catch up to that. You know, I hear some in my generation saying, oh, they wouldn't want to talk with me. Well, let me tell you, I have been talking with millennials, not to them, but with them, for over 20 years. And from the time they were, you were, you know, in elementary school all the, all the way up now into college. And I've discovered that millennials are very eager to talk with older adults. They, as long as we take them seriously and listen and respond to them in a, in a polite way and really be intrigued with what they're saying and make them feel valued, which doesn't everyone want to feel valued, they, they'll talk their heads off. My, husband's, <laughs> my husband has watched me in a couple of these interviews and he's ready to go. He's like ready to go 30 minutes after we're there and I'm still just really engaged in what someone's saying and I think that's what we need to, to engage we need to think about as we engage millennials. And I don't say that just because I think we have great wisdom to impart. I think you have wisdom to impart, and I think we do as well, and I think there should be a sharing there. You're a well-educated, diverse group of adults, and we need every one of your votes and your voices along with ours. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at Georgetown. Um, it's even a greater pleasure to be speaking on behalf of my fellow um, symposium members, uh, speaking on behalf of an engaged, intellectual, and excited group of millennials um, is an absolute honor. Uh, given the variety of opinions that the survey shows and given the variety of opinions represented by the fellows who are attending the campaign, I'm gonna do my absolute best. A conversation that we had this morning when discussing the survey results that lasted longer than some of the others was the one regarding religion and voting and how millennials see the importance of a presidential campaign's religion. And because that was a big focus and a big point of interest for what millennials discussed just this morning, I want to focus and hone in on that just a little bit. Given that 49% um, of younger millennials say that a president's or a candidate's religious affiliation is very important, and given that 48% think that it isn't necessarily, I think that we see a very big paradox in the fact that much of the world's events today are being fueled by religious difference. But at the same time, we have a group of people who are going to be voting and engaged in this election that haven't been before that are moving more towards religious unaffiliation. And I think that that paradox is one that is definitely one that needs to be unpacked a little bit. Why is it that this group of voters isn't going to be identifying with a particular religious tradition, but at the same time, much of the issues that we vote on and much of the policies that are going to impact this nation and the world are rooted in such religious difference? 
And I think given that, it's important to take the context of the survey and apply it to what's happening in the world today. Given that just this year we had acts of religious hatred in the country, given everything that's happening in the Middle East, it's so important to consider religion, values, and ethics in regards to who millennials want to vote for. And with that, we see that 50% of millennials said that they wouldn't be comfortable with a Mormon president. 52% said they wouldn't be okay or comfortable with an atheist. And a staggering 64% said that they wouldn't be comfortable with a Muslim president. And though those numbers may be shocking to those of us that do consider ourselves to be more religiously pluralistic, it's a point of concern for what that means for the American democracy as a whole. Given that Americans are concerned with the content of a, morals of a politician's moral character, it's important to discuss what defines that moral character, which creates an interesting paradox again. Given that most millennials are very progressive in that they believe that their religion and race isn't necessarily going to impact their job prospects, we see that it's over six out of 10 millennials say that they don't think that their uh, gender or race is going to impact how successful essentially that they're going to be. But then at the same time, you've got this same group of millennials saying that they would be uncomfortable with a president who wasn't evangelical Protestant. And given this discrepancy between what different race lines and gender lines uh, can conclude as a consensus in regards to being successful, but different in regards to who they would vote to put in office, I think that that points to an, another very interesting pa uh, facet of the millennial generation. Why is it that across uh, gender lines and race lines, we can agree that those things won't impact how successful we are, but they do impact what we think about a politician? I think that that's an interesting point in regards to the millennial generation. Um, and so with that, I think it's important to understand and sort of debunk rumors about why this is occurring. Why is it that most millennials are uncomfortable with seeing a Muslim president, even though about half of them said that they don't really care if this president is going to be religiously affiliated? The answer, I think, is very obvious. 9-11 shook this nation and has driven politics in this nation and has made voters develop a certain sort of consensus in regards to what they think Islam and different religions have to say and whether or not they would be comfortable with those opinions being brought into the American political sphere. The millennial generation is unlike any others for a lot of reasons. One reason is that unlike our predecessors, millennials have lived in a time where the term Muslim and Islam has been in the media. And I think that that has driven us to find that the survey results do offer an accurate depiction about, about what most people and what most millennials think. But with that, we have to understand that even though those differences occur, that we're still progressing pretty significantly. Even though over 60% wouldn't be okay or comfortable with a Muslim president, it would be inaccurate to say that millennials haven't made progress or headway. Um, it's clear to see that given the 66% of millennials that are registered, though that has gone down a little bit since the 2008 election, our generation has made significant headway in political activism. It's the millennial generation that came out in great numbers in 08. It's the millennial generation that made the Occupy movement. The millennial generation has proven that it has the capacity, aptitude, drive, and energy to be engaged. And I think even though there are those differences in regards to theological um, perceptions that millennials and American voters have, that that's something that millennials will be, aver will be able to overcome. The president gave a speech in Cairo in June of 2009 addressing the Muslim world, something that was absolutely unprecedented. And I think given that and the importance that religious difference has in the events that are driving the world today, millennials are more and more aware that they've ought to be um, more ready to tackle these issues and develop an opinion on them. And so with that, I would just like to thank you all for having me. And I'm interested in seeing what uh, the fellows have to say in regards to how religion and politics drives what millennials are thinking. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Hira. Um, and uh, I'd like to involve the audience as, as quickly as possible, but I had one follow-up question for Dan to maybe shine a little light on part of the survey. As you mentioned, you didn't have time to get to, to all the results. 
Uh, and this is a question about the disillusionment factor and something that we uh, discussed earlier with uh, the Millennial Values Fellows earlier in the day. On page 47, there is a very striking question. I, I take you to page 47 because toward the end of the report, you have some comps or comparable results for older generations. And it's interesting to see where uh, differences are stark. At the bottom of the first column on page 47, the question is, when you think and talk about government, do you tend to think of it more as the government or more as our government? So the issue of alienation from, from government. Millennials, uh, only 12%, one out of eight, uh, agreed with the statement that they think of it as our government. 86%, the government, more of a distance. The general population's split, about 50-50. So Dan, I wonder if you could comment on that, but also maybe get at the issue which is bound to come up in the wider conversation of how many of these differences that we see are generational effects. In other words, 10, 20 years ago, questions about disillusionment from government, would we have seen similar differences across generational divides, or is this something new that we're seeing today? It's a great question. Um, I, I think in, in order to answer, we really need to understand something about the context and how views of government have changed over time. So, um, you know, you go back to the, the 60s, uh, and government was actually viewed fairly favorably uh, among the populace. And then over the next 20, 30 years, uh, they, and even into uh, the millennium, they declined dramatically. So when millennials came of age, uh, they were in an a political environment where uh, government became sort of a dirty word, a bad word. Um, and I think that had a profound effect on their relationship to government. Um, I think also the, the fact that, uh, you know, particularly we see huge differences between seniors and millennials, um, uh, age 65 and older. I think that's also uh, that cohort uh, grew up in a time um, where they were asked to make you know, extraordinary sacrifices for their country. Um, and then that is not something that we've actually seen. Uh, you know, this uh, age cohort have the sort of same responsibility asked of them of their government. And so I think that connection uh, is lost, or it hasn't, hasn't been uh, uh, created. Excellent. Well, let's uh, open it up. I, I believe we have uh, two mics. So uh, if you'd like to ask a question of the panel or maybe comment on, on the results, uh, raise your hand. I'd ask you to stand up and um, maybe briefly introduce yourself before you pose your question or, or make your comment. Up here in front, uh, Amir. Hi, uh, my name is Amir. I'm one of the Millennial Values Fellows. And my question is uh, about the general distrust towards institutions. Does, um, are there any specific questions that address the branch's government specifically, such as, I mean, the Congress or the Supreme Court? Because there have been a lot of politicized Supreme Court uh, decisions recently, and pretty soon we're going to have a decision about affirmative action. So do millennials, are there any questions that address their uh, feelings towards other branches of government? Uh, and a good question. Uh, we didn't ask anything specifically about Congress or the Supreme Court. Um, recent surveys have shown that uh, Congress, I think, went. To, we've seen historic lows of uh, approval of Congress, and now views of the Supreme Court are also uh, falling dramatically. I think Pew found um, that they're at around 40 percent or something like that. Um, and I don't have uh, age breaks, but I'm pretty sure that younger people are tracking uh, Americans overall. Mm -hmm. Bryce. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm Bryce. I'm one of the Millennial Values Fellows, and my question is concerning. I did like the inclusion of the question about um, whether or not the parents took the child uh, to the voting booth, but I'm wondering if the t there's s sort of seemed to be an implication that by doing that, there was a l greater likelihood of voter turnout when they got older. And I'm almost wondering if that is uh, correlation meets cause means causation, because I don't know if that's the fact that they went into the booth, or maybe that you know they had greater their greater access to politics. They're more affluent because uh, statistics show that more affluent people are more likely to turn up in the voters' booth. So, is there a specific? statistical tie between being taken to the voting booth and then likewise being uh, wanting to do it when you're get, getting older. Because I know like my parents took me in, and even though that I still remember that, that's not necessarily a formative influence on my politics. Right. Uh, there is, and it's a strong one. So we actually ran some models where we controlled for things like education, which is strongly correlated to voter turnout, uh, race and ethnicity, gender. Um, a whole bunch of uh, demographic controls. And even uh, with including those, holding constant those uh, different characteristics, we find that um, 
uh, millennials who, whose parents uh, took them to the voting booth were four times more likely uh, to vote or to, um, to say they're certain to vote than uh, uh, millennials who, who did not. Can I say something? Please, Laura. Yeah. Um, and having been one of those parents who did that, um, I, I think it's not just the fact that those parents who take their kids into the voting booth are also probably talking about politics at the dinner table. I mean, the political discourse in a family like that is greater than in other families, probably. And so I think that it's not, it's not taking them necessarily into the voting booth alone. I mean, obviously, it's not that only. But it's also kind of the, the family atmosphere and the willingness and eagerness to talk about the political situation. In the next survey, we can ask uh, kids uh, whose parents took them to the voting booth and let them push the button. If that, yes. uh, yes. if that had an impact. That was Laura's concern. I still get nervous about that when I take my kids. Um, further questions? In the back? Yep. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Steve Peck. I'm a U.S. Army War College fellow. Uh, and I was curious, did... Um, as you looked at religion amongst the millennial generation, did you see more of a distinction of that generation vis-a-vis you know, -vis other generations and their religious attitudes? Or was it, did you think it was perhaps more a function of life phase, i.e. Uh, transition through emerging adulthood uh, you know, onto subsequent life phases? Did you see one of those to be uh, predominant on its influence within the generation? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we definitely know that um, younger folks in, in their, where they are in the life cycle are, are more likely to be, uh, you know, dis dissociate from religion and they, they go move away to college. Um, they're no longer, uh, you know, going with their parents. Um, but as they get older, they get married, they, you know, uh, buy a house, uh, become more, more stabilized, they're more likely to return to church. That has definitely been true in the past. There's some evidence, though, that the, the change that we're seeing among uh, millennials who are disaffiliating is a more permanent state. Um, and there's been a variety of theories thrown around, uh, one of which is the sort of more, the, the association of, of Christianity in particular with conservative brand of politics um, and uh, associated with particular issues where millennials really stick out. So for instance, same-sex marriage. Uh, we actually saw that, um, we, I'm turning to the, the recent report, we actually asked millennials what they thought about uh, present-day Christianity. And this is on page 32. Uh, we found among uh, millennial Christians, yeah, sorry, this is the previous survey um, that we ran, 54% um, said uh, Christianity can be described as judgmental, 58% uh, anti-gay, um, and 49% uh, said hypocritical. So there's uh, it's lots of, uh, uh, and, and we can debate about you know, what's causing these views, but there's definitely uh, more negative views about uh, religion in general among this cohort than we've seen previously. I don't know, if, Laura, if you have anything to add. Kira, do you no, want to you said it great. Okay. <laughs> Just feel free to jump in here if, sure. if, if you'd like. Um, other questions? Uh, one over here, and then we'll come back on this side of the room. Shahrazad? Yeah. Hello. So just, just a little a question is when you ask uh, that their gender and their race will not have an effect on their finding a, you know, a job. Is it the same as asking if their religion would? Because then the question on the politicians is about the religion, not a, I think it's just because you said there is a paradox. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you had asked this millennium generation, would, would the gender and the race have a difference if for a politician? Maybe you would have gotten the same result as when you were. It, it's just a little question. I don't know if it's, I don't know if we're comparing the same elements, I guess. Hira, could you speak sure. to that? Sure. I was actually, I was thinking along the same regards, but I think the reason why I found those two figures to correlate was because of the idea that you've got a generation that's more progressive and that there's a very big commonality amongst different uh, races as shown by the survey, that they don't think that those will have an impact. But at the same time, this same progressive generation is showing that you know, in fairly staggering numbers, that the religious affiliation of a candidate um, will impact how comfortable they are. So when you've got a progressive uh, generation that you know is statistically more favoring of um, uh, of a same sex ma same sex marriage uh, and uh, talks about how there isn't a necessary need for affirmative action anymore. Um, 
I'm curious as to why that doesn't align with the way that this generation thinks that uh, religious affiliation would impact as well. That's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, I would just I would add one thing. So one of the things that came out uh, in the previous report was the profound effect that college education, uh, specifically four-year college education, has on the attitudes of uh, younger millennials. We, we looked at, in that survey, on, on social issues. So we found that uh, four-year uh, college graduates were much more liberal on things like same-sex marriage than uh, millennials who had not yet um, completed a four-year college uh, degree. Um, I think that also is likely true uh, on views of religious pluralism, pluralism as well, um, where college is having a pretty significant impact. And a lot of this age cohort either isn't in college uh, yet or is just sort of beginning. Um, and so their attitudes are still uh, being shaped. Good, we had a couple over here. Hi, um, my name is Tyler Bishop. I'm a second year student at Vanderbilt University. Um, I just wanted to point out that what Ms. Stepp said about um, integrating technology with um, politics and the government, um, it really resonated with me because so much of what society does, uh, particularly our generation, happens on this 13 inch screen that we see in front of us. And um, so I guess my question is, and maybe it doesn't have a clearly defined answer yet, and maybe it's just a conversation starter, but what are some ways right now that we can start that process into getting government and politics more integrated with technology? Dan, there, there were some questions in the survey that relate to this about how uh, millennials get their news, where they've seen political advertising, um, they get to this issue of what's the platform now for political communication uh, among this generation? Yeah, no, they're, they actually, we were a little surprised. So they're definitely more likely to, to use social media um, for news, but by and large, uh, it's still television. Uh, uh, although I, I think that we didn't maybe explicitly, maybe more millennials are watching TV on their computers, on their internet, um, on, online. So that's something that we could definitely look into. But I actually want to mention something else. This is, that was a, a great point. Um, there was a recent study in Nature uh, that looked at uh, using Facebook to influence voter turnout. Um, and this wasn't confined to millennials. It was look, look at, the, at the whole population. Uh, and they found that just seeing a message, I voted, from one of your friends increased uh, turnout among the people who had seen that message, um, which has pr pretty dramatic implications if we think about how prevalent uh, social media is among uh, this age group. So 85% of younger millennials have a Facebook uh, page and, and two thirds of you are on every day. So uh, given the prevalence of the use, that the fact that it can make a big difference in, in things like voter turnout um, is something definitely to be, to be talking about. I think we should, um, we should assign you to build a site <laughs> that would encourage debate um, and I'm, I'm only half joking here, and it doesn't have to be you, but I think that if we, if, and maybe there are these sites and I don't know about, but I think most of the political discussion I've seen are on sites that talk about a lot of other things. And, and if you could build a site, or if there could be a site where there is debate, where it's you know bipartisan discussion, um, civil, if that's possible, um, and, and I mean, I don't know. Would there be an audience for that? I, I, I see some debate on you know, some, a couple of sites, but I don't look at a lot of sites. Maybe this is already happening, but it just seems to me that that's where it needs to be taking place. OK, let's see. Um, we had a question right here, and then we'll move back over here. Um, well. Just, I have another question, please, but uh, please introduce yourself. I'm Jamie, Jamie Kane. I'm with the Christian Science Committee on Publications Federal Office. I'm interning there this fall. Um, and just a quick follow up question to what you were just saying um, Do millennials really want to debate, or do they just want to hear what they already believe said by other people? Um, I mean, <laughs> are they any different from the rest of us? I mean, we all want to hear our own voices. But I do think that, um, really do think that you're, you're more engaged in debate than, than our generation. I mean, we were almost, 
monolithic in our political views at certain points in history. And that's not true anymore. Um, I hear a lot more uh, discussion in dorm rooms. And the thing that's always amazed me is how, is how millennials can, can tear each other up and then go out for a beer. Um, <laughs> No, I'm serious. That's really a, a, one of the most admirable traits in your generation is that you don't, you know, you don't put people down in a way that, or you don't, you don't want to be just with your kind, whatever that means. Um, but you, you almost relish that kind of debate and conversation that goes on at the bars or wherever, and, and to a certain extent um, on social media. But... Um, I th absolutely think that there's, there's an openness here that, that certainly previous generations didn't have. I mean, we make up our, we make up our minds pretty early and then forget about it. And, and you all, beca partly because you're still making up your minds and partly because I think you're more open-minded in general as a generation, I think that's a huge opportunity. And yet the survey points to that tremendous power of parents over their yeah. kids' uh, political preferences. I mean. 96% of young people whose parents both identify with Obama are voting for Obama. I mean, that's quite striking. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's some paradoxes here, too. But at least it would, but I guess in terms of engagement and yeah. getting you to the polls, the more discussion and debate you have with each other, the more likely you are, it would seem to me, I'm not a social scientist, it would seem to me the more likely you are to go and pull that, that handle on the, at the voting booth. And that's, that's really what we need here, I think. I, mean, I, I would say that uh, millennials definitely have, uh, there are more sources now, uh, media sources out there, uh, that providing confirmatory views, whether you're you know, conservative, moderate, liberal, out there than there ever, ever been before. Um, so in that sense, it's much easier to find something, you know, someone saying something you already agree with. However, interpersonally, um, it's probably more difficult for millennials because of the great degree of diversity among the millennial generation. Um, you know, on Facebook, you know, on your Facebook page, you may post from you know a whole variety of different people from different backgrounds, um, exposing you to a bunch of different ideas. Um, so I, I, you, I could see it cutting both ways. See, so Xenia, yeah. and then Daniel and Zach. Oh, uh, oh sorry, you had a follow up. Yeah. yeah uh, another question, uh, just very quickly. Um, we one thing that's really come up is disillusionment, but uh, the, a sense of optimism for the future. Um, and I guess, is that optimism based in if millennials themselves kind of like, well, give me the government and I would do better than, you know, those old people? <laughs> or um, is it, I don't know, how is that optimism grounded, I guess? That's a big question. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'll dive in and, and take a stab at this. So one of the reasons I think there was a lot of... Um, excitement around Obama's candidacy in 2008 was uh, if you actually look at the, uh, you know, a photograph of Congress, um, millennials do not see themselves, right? The, the composition of Congress, you know, older, basically white people for the most part, um, it, they don't look like, like the millennials look. There's much more racial, uh, ethnic uh, diversity among the millennial generation. So I, I think as that starts changing, um, you know, you may actually see more buy-in from millennials on, oh, well, this candidate actually looks and sounds like me or has similar experiences than me. Um, and that may be true with any, every generation, but I think it might be particularly true um, with this one. All right, let, let's collect maybe, th there are three hands over here, collect some questions and comments, and then uh, take it back to the panel. Zinia, um, yeah. My name is Xenia Framrose, and I'm one of the fellows, and I have a bit of a cough, so excuse me. Um, I think my question also related to disillusionment, and it's something of a comment and a question. Um, what Hira said towards the end of her comments was that, you know, the millennial generation has shown that we, are, we have the capacity to be engaged, we have the energy, and we have the aptitude. But then why aren't we engaged? Why are we so disillusioned? I mean, I think there are two results in the survey, and correct me if I'm wrong, that really show why we are disillusioned. One is the one that Professor Banshoff pointed out, saying that we have differences between what we see as the government and our government. And I think that the other one, oh, I can't remember the other one at this point, but <laughs> that was definitely one of them. <laughs> um, and I think that I personally see that. Um, I mean, definitely as a woman um, right now, as a millennial woman, 
you see that the government doesn't accurately represent us. And I think I'd, I'd love to hear more about gender in the survey as well. Um, and I think the other reason we see it is campaign finance. And that's something else I'd like to see in the survey because we, oh, that's, the other, that's the other statistic. We don't think that our vote matters. And I mean, I don't know if my vote's going to matter when there are several people who are buying campaigns and donating as much as they want to because of Citizens United. So why, why do people on this panel think that millennials are so disillusioned? Okay, let's uh, hear from Daniel and Zach. Did you also have a Hi, my name is Daniel. I attend the University of California, Berkeley. I'm a Millennial Values Fellow as well. Um, one of the things we're talking about in terms of our generation, I think it's important not to be apocalyptic, but also not overly idealistic. I attend Berkeley. I tend, my politics tend toward the right. And I would say Berkeley's not tolerant of my views. Um, and so I think we, we come at this place saying, okay, our generation is very tolerant, but I ha think we have to ask, what does tolerance mean? Does it mean the acceptance of opposing viewpoints, meaning we allow them to be aired, or does it mean we have these natural assumptions that you have to build into? And I think that's what happens, at least for me, at you know, the People's Republic of Berkeley or whatever. Um, you see a lot of this evidence of um, conservatives being crowded out, and by Broad standards, I'm, I'm a Democrat, I'm a, I'm, in, I'm a conservative Democrat, but on Berkeley, I might as well be as right as they get. Um, so I think we have to really define what does tolerance mean in this context and what does it mean to be open-minded? Um, because a lot of the times, I think we still clump, um, we still just listen to what we want to see, and I think demanding conformity, um, that kills diversity. If diversity really means open views, if it means you're really ready to hear what I have to say, and respect it and respect my right to sit, it's, it's very different and I think what you see here at, with a bunch of the fellows here is very different from what you might see at a regular college campus, even among people who are, um, we would consider educated. Thank you, Zach. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Zach Yenser. I'm a senior at Arizona State University and I'm a Millennial Values Fellow. Uh, I had a question or a topic that um, is directed, I think, in different ways to each member, of, each member of the panel, and that is, is there a difference uh, or a growing difference among millennials in uh, personal faith versus faith in the public sphere? Um, throughout the religious um, portion of the report, we see that whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you're between that 18, 24, 18, 26 age, you have a lot of, um, you place a lot of value on value and religion. Um, but we see in certain social circumstances, as soon as that enters the public sphere, there's inward and outward groans. And I think on a statistical level, that would be interesting. Uh, and, and perhaps um, uh, Ms. Session Step and, and Hera could comment on that. Is, is, there, is, that a value, is that a valuable point to discuss, the difference between religion on an individual level and, and a, in a public sphere? Um, I think it's a very valid point. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, we can, Americans, a large number of Americans are very uncomfortable discussing their personal faith. So, um, you know, I can give you a personal, I mean, a personal example. When I started covering religion at the Washington Post, I covered it as a cultural phenomenon, not not particularly, uh, it was not, a, I was not the church woman by any means. Um, but people would come up to me and say, why did you want that be? You know, and now granted that was some years ago, but I think there is still among a certain number of, a large number of Americans, really keep their personal beliefs about God and, and various moral issues and Jesus or Muhammad, whatever it is, they keep that very quiet. Um, they're not comfortable uh, talking about it in public. And then you, ha so you have the quiet ones, the silent ones, and then you have the ones who are very vocal about their religion. And, and I think there needs to be, I mean, you raise a good point. I think there needs to be, you know, we need to quiet the ones down over here a little bit. And we need to raise the voices of those over here. We need to have a meeting of the minds here. We shouldn't have to apologize for being a religious believer or not, but you should be able to discuss it in a civil way and how does it affect your life. And, and so I think that's the discussion we need to have. But I, don't say, I haven't seen that change. I don't know that it's going to change. I just think there's a large segment of America that does not want to talk about their faith. 
except in very private circles. What I think makes American voters very distinctive from uh, voters in other democracies around the world, particularly Europe, is that we put a large amount of emphasis on the content of a politician's character. We care about what their values, morals, and ethics are, and that's why religion lines up directly with that. I think that that's why, the, that's why these questions are being asked. Um, how comfortable would you be with a person of, of a different faith tradition as your candidate for president? And I think given that, given that American voters are very different from our European counterparts, I think that there is going to be a I think that it's important to ask the question about religion in the public sphere. Uh, and I think that the survey results, to me, say that on the whole, millennials do think that a faith tradition is going to impact the style of leadership and the decisions that a politician is going to make. I don't know that that's going to change. Um, the name of the prime minister in France is escaping me, but uh, it was a story in the news that not mer many Americans, I think, were aware of, that there was a prime minister in France who um, had a mistress. And after he died, his widow and the mistress both attended the, uh, the funeral. And French voters were not phased. It really didn't make much of a difference. But then we've got Bill Clinton. And you know, these are interesting questions that I think that we should be asking in regards to how democracy functions in America in regards to what voters value versus what democracy and voters across the world value. And I think that it's of critical importance that we ask whether or not religion penetrates into what a politician is going to do in the public sphere. Uh, and I think on the whole, as of now, uh, what the survey shows us is that millennials do think that it has an impact. Dan? Yeah. So I want to swing back around to the disillusionment. Um, and one of the things that we haven't really talked about is the current economic situation facing uh, younger millennials right now um, is you know, one of the worst that this uh, age group has ever faced uh, in, in recent years, for sure. So uh, I just did some looking at the census. The jobless rate among uh, younger millennials is about 10%, significantly higher uh, than the unemployment rate overall. One quarter of younger millennials are currently living at home. Uh, these are college graduates, by the way. Uh, and millennial college graduates are much more likely to work in jobs that do not require a college degree or work in jobs that pay by the hour than older college graduates. So part of what's going on is definitely uh, the here and now. So this is a group that's facing economic hardship, um, which definitely has uh, you know, strong implications for how millennials are viewing government. Government sort of failed them in, in some way. The other thing we need to remember is that uh, in some ways, this age group isn't that different than young people uh, in any generation. Uh, they're just less likely to be engaged. They're moving around a lot. Um, as, uh, as they sort of proceed through the life cycle, they get married, uh, have kids, settle down, um, start paying taxes. Uh, you tend to tune into government and what they're doing a, a little bit more frequently. So I, you know, I would not throw up my hands and say, oh, there's no hope uh, for you all in, in, in this uh, age group. And, and when it comes to um, uh, civic engagement, I, I think that they're, we're facing a particularly a hardship for this, this group, um, but overall, the you know the trend line looks uh, pretty pretty positive. I would be uh, more or less optimistic about um, future political engagement among this group. Well, that would that would be a great note on which to end. But we do have a little more time, so let's gather maybe a final set of, of questions and, and comments. Yes, and then up front. Um, so um, I'm with PRI, and I have a question from Twitter. Um, from Rachel Peroni. Um, can you place millennials moving away from religious affiliation in a larger trend of rejection of labels of all kinds? <laughs> Except for designer jeans. They really <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you all can answer this too. I, I, yeah, I, I definitely think millennials don't want to be categorized. And um, and then that depend, you know, that that's everything from what they eat and what they wear. A very diverse, eclectic group of let's take young women's dress for example. Um, it's not necessarily designer anymore. You know, it could be bargain basement clothes. And so there's a there's very um, they're just open to a lot of new ideas, and that's that is actually a, a big opportunity for political parties. Uh, but it's also um, a danger that, that, that they don't form solid opinions around certain brands or certain parties. 
definitely uh, overall uh, dealignment from party identification, dealignment from organized religion, um, kind of individualization of, of affiliations and orientations. Um, still too early to say, though, right, how much of this is uh, just a generational effect that will change as millennials move into the workforce, have families, and so on. But the early indications are that there's more of this individualization going on, right, than, than we've seen in previous generations at this point. All right, we have uh, two more. Let's just have two final comments, questions, and then have the panelists provide some final remarks. Hello, my name is Mohammed. I'm also a, a fellow here. My question is, uh, perhaps, is it possible to deduce at all from the data how amenable uh, millennials are to sort of change? I mean, certainly uh, President Obama remarked, and it was kind of a significant remark, was said that in his, his inauguration speech, you know, he first acknowledged non-believers as a member of the electorate, and this was the first time a president did this. We saw in, the, um, in your presentation how Americans have, in fact, gone more sort of accepting of Mormonism uh, over just by way of, you know, President Rahm, I'm sorry, President Rahm, uh, <laughs> Mr. Rahm. After last night. Well, that debate really got to me. Um, <laughs> um, of uh, Governor Romney running so that, you know, we became more familiar with his candidacy and as a result his faith, despite his not, you know, bringing it up. So, I mean, to specifically speak to uh, millennials, and I realize this is obviously not in the data and it'd be difficult to sort of construct a question, but I guess my question is directed at you, uh, Dan. Is it possible to judge relative to other generations or relative to, you know, any other sort of branch of the American populace is this generation more amenable to change? Are their views uh, more sort of, uh, are they as stationary as they can be, or can we expect over time as they settle down and, or you know, uh, get older, or pay taxes, what have you, uh, that they will have the views that they always have, or with respect to sort of these you know barometers that have been set already, you know, or that, that have been articulated here, or how much of this is just purely a reflection of the here and now? You, you mentioned briefly uh, the economic crisis being a sort of a, a meaningful reflection of uh, their disillusion with government now. But I mean, perhaps with these other metrics, you know, with religion, with politics, et cetera, are they, can they change and develop, you know, if we have a, a Muslim president running or if we have, a, you know, an atheist president running, what have you? Right, hold on, let's get the last, uh, Emily, last question, comment. Hi, um, I'm Emily. I'm also one of the Millennial Values Fellows, and I want to talk a little bit about what Xenia was asking, but I have a more specific question about uh, the results for our government versus the government, and I was wondering whether there's an age breakdown among younger millennials on that, because I'm 21, so I'm kind of in the middle of the younger millennials, and um, largely it's not my government because I didn't vote for a lot of it. I voted in uh, one congressional election, so for one slate of the House and Senate, and uh, I voted in the primary, but um, a lot of those elected re representatives for me and for millennials who are younger than I am are not ours. We didn't vote for them or against them, but we didn't have any say in, in uh, who they are. So I'm wondering if that's something that might change as uh, we do get to vote and we do have some say in who gets elected. I, kn I know there's a lot on the 18 to 29 year old. Uh, yeah. So is there differences there between that long, wider range of millennials and the narrower range that we're looking at? It's, yeah. yeah, it's a great question and congratulations for voting in a congressional election. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the, this relationship with government, I mean, yeah, young millennials haven't really engaged with their government um, very much. And, and the way most Americans, one of the closest relations most Americans have uh, with their government is either giving a check to the government when they pay their taxes or getting a check from the government. Um, when it comes to state and local government, the connections are much closer. You think of the DMV. Uh, but when, uh, which is, again, not always positive. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I think for this group, they, there hasn't been a, a really strong connection uh, to their government. I mean, there was some after 9-11, but it dissipated actually pretty quickly. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that, you know, as we sort of see this group age and grow, um, there will be a relationship, um, whether it's a positive or a negative one, uh, I think it sort of remains to be seen. Any final comments from Hira or Laura? Well, um, yeah, I was sitting here thinking that in not too many years you're going to be parents, some of you, and it may be maybe five or ten years from now, but um, or maybe more, uh, maybe never. Uh, but no, you're going to be parents, and... I know it's, for some of you, it's way too early to even think about this. 
But I, <laughs> but when you get to that point, I hope you remember that this conversation, and I hope you remember how important it is that you carry forward whatever your values are and what what your obvious interest is in the political process because you're here um, to your children. And even as you vote today, think about what kind of world do you want those children to live in? And what what kind of world? How do these candidates, the, the presidential candidates and local candidates, congressional candidates? How are they going to change the world, and what is it going to look like for your children? Um, I know that seems kind of an abstract concept, but I think if you can think of it as not just uh, this is this election, not just about me, but it's about people coming after me, that um, that will help you maybe make some of those decisions. Here. Here. Um, I remember a specific part of the research that I read that really resonated with me, uh, made me laugh, uh, and then made me a little sad at the same time, was the line about how uh, though, that, though millennials vary quite a bit in terms of political ideology, race, um, and uh, their results to the survey obviously highlight those differences, the one thing that a lot of us have in common is our disillusionment with the government, and I think that that's unfortunate that that's the one common denominator that stretches across all those lines of difference. Um, but at the same time, I do think that there is a little bit of hope. Um, the survey highlights that despite our pessimism about the government and politicians, um, more than two thirds of millennials are nonetheless saying that voting gives people like me some say about how gov the government run th runs things. And I think that that is an important statistic that we ought not forget. That although there is quite a bit of difference in the way that we think and uh, what we think about uh, the democratic process, that 66% of us are registered and that there's a group of us that are talking about it. Thank you. Well, we've come to the end of this uh, very formal presentation, but the conversation around these issues will continue online. Uh, in the social media, we have a, a web page. Uh, through the Berkeley Center where the Millennial Values Fellows are engaging with colleagues their age uh, and others around these issues. So I invite you to keep uh, in touch with us as we pursue this conversation forward. Uh, at the end uh, of this session, a couple of thanks are in order uh, to our teams at PRRI and at the Berkeley Center. And I'd like to call out especially Aaron Taylor, our Director of Communications, for all their work in pulling together this survey. Uh, the Millennial Values Fellows are with us uh, these couple of days from around the country for these conversations. You all for coming, and please join me in thanking our panel.